Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, after marching on tax day for science and for the ecosystem, some are thinking about going a step further to taking direct action and even risking arrest. We'll talk about the history of direct action with Ellie Kaufman and Jesse Meyerson, two longtime organizers and writers with an experience in the history of direct action and building sustainable movements. All that and then a sneak peek at preparations for the People's Climate March, scheduled for April 29th, and what is at stake in the fight for the climate. This is The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. No nukes, act up, Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, Standing Rock. What lessons from the history of direct action are relevant to the times of Trump? And what do we know about the role of protest in shifting power or moving policy? Can street heat translate into organized movement over time? It certainly happened on the right. The first months of the Trump administration have seen major opposition mobilizations that continue, but after all the disruption, what comes next? We're joined by two guests today who are grappling with this very question. L.A. Kaufman is a journalist, longtime activist, and the author of the brilliantly timed, recently released book, Direct Action, Protest and the Reinvention of American Radicalism. Jesse Meyerson's an organizer and a writer currently working with the New York Nurses Association. His writings have appeared in the Washington Post, The Village Voice, Rolling Stone, The Nation, and right here. Thank you both for coming in. It's great to have you. A pleasure to be so here. So let's start with the geniusly, brilliantly timed release of your book, Direct Action. Um, what does the term actually mean for people that don't know? Well, I define it very broadly. Um, like any term like this, it's debated extensively within movements, and there are some people who want a very narrow definition where it's just stopping an injustice in its tracks, like using uh, your body to block a bulldozer. Um, but I define it as any of the, the pressure tactics that are outside the established channels of political participation and influence. So everything ranging from fairly mild tactics like rallies to stronger things like sit-ins and blockades. Now, your book catalogs dozens, decades of direct actions. I was part of a shockingly large number of them. Um, but is this the exclusive purview of the left? It's not. There, there are certainly examples of direct action movements on the right. The most notorious would probably be Operation Rescue, which um, used uh, you know, direct action blockades to prevent women from accessing reproductive health services. But it's been a lot rarer. And I think part of that is because um, there's, a, there's a small d democratic ethos that's kind of baked into the way that, that, that people do direct action. And that's um, th that's almost a prerequisite for people to take the level of personal risk that it, it entails. So, all right, so now that we've got our terms clear, I'd love the both of you to weigh in a little bit on, on what you see as the relationship between this kind of direct action that you're talking about and the kind of movement building that you more often report on. Um, Jesse, I mean, you're a direct action fan, but you really write about uh, m movement organizing more than just mobilizing people into the streets. And I shouldn't use that word just, we'll get to that. Um, I think they're vital for uh, reinforcing one another, that um, through direct action, strikes, rallies, these sorts of things open political space and uh, claim new political terrain, open up new ideas to cons for consideration, um, but that in order to um, consecrate them and in order to advance them in a political sense, um, we need a, a movement, a, a sort of ongoing organizing effort that um, gets people not just mobilized, but also ideologically coherent and ready to take action at a moment's notice and in relationship with one another. And that with these two things um, balancing one another, uh, each can increase the other and eventually can uh, lead to the realization of an actual program. And so what do you see happening right now in this, in this sort of arena, LA? Well, I mean, there's obviously been, uh, you know, an extraordinary flourishing of street protests since the, the, the day of the inauguration. And what we've seen, I think, has been, um, you know, the, the flourishing of a, of, a, of a movement of movements, that we're not seeing a single organization or, or a single issue um, in the forefront. Instead, what we're seeing is this vast decentralized landscape of lots and lots of people and organizations in motion. Are you excited? 
I mean, it's, it's a funny time because it, I've had this conversation with a lot of other organizers where on the one hand, it's, you know, we, we, we all have nightmares about the incredible damage that's unfolding in front of us. This feels um, like a uniquely perilous time in American politics. So it's a very scary time. And, and yet um, it's also a moment where um, both the scale and the character of the resistance that have emerged are more promising than anything I've seen in decades of organizing. So it feels strange to be upbeat and optimistic when things are so dire and when we know that, um, that, that the power of the resistance will not be adequate to stop mm -hmm. the damage. And yet, um, after you know, years and years of seeing small scale efforts um, have large results, it's hard not to mm -hmm. feel um, encouraged by this large-scale flourishing right now. Well, another thing I'd love to get the both of you to weigh in on is to what extent is what we're seeing new, triggered by Trump at all, and what is it a continuation of organizing that we've seen around the Fight for 15 movement and, and Occupy going back through the last eight years of the Obama administration? I mean, I definitely think that the um, protest movements of the Obama administration each um, led to the next one and created new movement infrastructure that the that the next movement moment could draw on and uh, use to increase its numbers and stuff. And so I think over the course of that period, we established a pretty firm uh, foundation for things like um, the Women's March, which um, drew on the leadership from previous uh, iterations of these kind of movements and um, the, the tools that were developed, the communications tools for decentralized uh, seemingly spontaneous, not spontaneous, but viral actions, um, which were really honed during the Obama era, put to good use in the airport protests and things like that. So I, I think that there's an extent to which it's um, it's continuous. I think that the, the new development is that um, liberals have joined the left in these things, which was led to uh, greatly increased numbers. And partly that's because of Donald Trump as a unique figure who smashes norms and destroys what people expect politics to look like. I think if it had been perhaps a more conventional Republican president, we might not be seeing liberals joining in such great numbers. Yeah, what's your thought on that? I think the question of um, the newly activated liberals is, the, in a lot of ways, the most interesting political question right now. Um, where, you know, uh, where is that energy going to go, and 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 what are folks willing to do? Um, certainly, you know, the numbers at um, the women's march and and the energy for some of the the things that are coming up um, this spring, are, you know, are bringing in huge numbers of people who maybe voted, maybe gave to a candidate, but who had not. Um, seen themselves as activists, and had certainly not seen themselves as outsiders to the system in the, in this new way. And um, I think the the question of whether that um, that whole upsurge of energy can be used not just to swell the numbers in street protests, but to actually engage with the Democratic Party in a new and dramatically different way is the big question of our time. So let's get to a couple of more tricky questions, to me anyway. One is, we had um, Boots Riley on the show not so long ago, and he was talking about how we've gotten very good in the U.S. Of, about demonstrating, but what exactly are we demonstrating? What's the power at the root of our demonstration? Are we? What he wanted to see is the demonstration of power to shut things down, um, to, to really force a change to take place. So that's one question. And then the other one is we've got some history now of demonstrations that don't have very clear demands, if any demands. Um, the Women's March being a case in point. What's the point? Um, did you have thoughts about that? And then what about that question of what are we demonstrating other than the fact that we can get a lot of people in the street? Demonstrations from the outside often look more or less all alike. Right. And it can be very hard to distinguish between different kinds of protests and the different jobs that they do. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I think that there's a, a real tendency to think of mass mobilizations and large-scale protests as principally as pressure tactics. And they, they usually don't work very well as pressure tactics. They're not very effective. Um, there's the, you know, you can come up with some counterexamples, and the big one would be the March on Washington in 63. Everyone kind of thinks of that model. People marched on Washington, and then somehow that helped create the upsurge of popular support that leads to civil rights legislation. It, it rarely works that way. Um, you know, it's not always as uh, uh, dispiriting as when, you know, we mobilized millions in the streets to stand against the Iraq War, and it did absolutely nothing 
to, um, to stop the U.S. invasion of Iraq. But oftentimes, um, a, a, the women's marches would be a prime example. The, the most important work that big mobilizations um, do is movement building. Mm -hmm. And they're more important, you know, I think of the women's marches as having been, um, as having broken a spell of fear and a kind of paralysis that people mm -hmm. were having after the election. Um, and emboldening people to act in a new way. That's very different from a protest that is really looking to um, pressure a very specific target to make a very concrete change. It's a, it's a more amorphous kind of protest. And I understand where people look at it and say, what's it doing? But part of what it's doing is it's, um, it's providing all those millions of people with an opportunity to do something they've never done before and you know, step outside their comfort zone and take more action, priming them to get involved in the kind of thing that Jesse's been talking about, some more ongoing organizational work that can build power over time. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. And I think that the um, airport protest was a perfect example of this, because on that day, people who perhaps had never protested before and were showing up to that tasted victory. And I think that that feeling of being in collective action with people and, and having a victory come down is intoxicating and will probably um, spur them on to, to do other things. I also think that the, um, the a big distinction here is uh, who's actually in power. I think of the protests that the Dreamers did in Obama campaign offices and Harry Reid's office, um, where previously Obama was saying, well, I can't just wave a magic wand and defer action on you know deportations. And these young people showed up, said, we have no papers, we have no fear, and we're shutting down your campaign office. And these are ostensibly members of the Obama coalition. And so it put real pressure on him. And he found that actually he could just wave a magic wand and defer action on it. Um, whereas, of course, Trump is much less susceptible to these sorts of protests because they're being uh, led by people who are not ostensibly part of his coalition. Mm. Now, you're actually going to Indiana to participate in some organizing. You want to tell us about that? Sure, yeah. I mean, the um, middle of the country is an area where democratic politics have uh, uh, basically abandoned the people and have failed and we've seen lots of commentary both during the election and after the election about how the white working class is this kind of simmering festering hate-filled basis of fascism and I, I think that's completely wrong I think fascism is a, a petty bourgeois phenomenon and that working class people can be brought together the history of America shows that they can be brought together across different forms of racial category and other sorts of identity that the episodes in American history when poor people have been brought together across racial category, uh, when those have been broken up, it's been because of official police action and the violence of wealthier, more affluent white people, not because poor people are so hateful that they can't be in coalition. And Indiana, the, the place where I'm going in Indiana in the, in the South, the 9th Congressional District is 97% white. It's got four or five points higher than the national mean poverty. Um, and these people, the only meaningful, well-organized vehicles that they've had for making meaning of their pain and their political lives have been right-wing xenophobic vehicles. And now that the right-wing xenophobes are in power, and what they're going to do is come for these people's food stamps and Medicaid and, and Social Security, um, I think they're going to be looking for alternatives. And um, that can either further entrench them into a fascist program, or if there's some diligent organizing on the left, can really foster a democratic people's movement and transform the politics of that state. So you're going to go out and do some of that organizing. Are there groups you're going to be working with? Um, I'm helping a friend who's from Bloomington uh, start up a thing called Hoosier Action. There's very little going on in Indiana. This is part of the problem. I mean, there are some places, North Carolina, there's some action going on, and Wisconsin, there's some action going on. Indiana's basically uh, uh, been a, a dearth of organizing. So we're starting something new, and uh, I have a, a great hopes that we'll be able to expand pretty quickly. So to two last things, LA, talk a bit about governance when it comes to direct action tactics, meaning how decisions get made. Because I learned a lot in, in protest movements around consensus building and, and coming to agreement that people can really feel safe in that isn't reflected anywhere in our electoral or so-called democratic process. And it might be interesting for people as we talk about making a new politics, a new way of governing ourselves, are there lessons coming out of the world of direct action that maybe we should be learning? Well, I think one of the things um, that has propelled a lot of direct action over time has been the extent to which people have used the process of protesting to also create a model of the kind of society they'd like to see. That's often messy, um, uh, and uh, sometimes it's in conflict with the more strategic aims of the movement, um, because it takes a lot of time to, to play out a model of 
like truly inclusive and democratic decision making, for instance, as, as one aspect of that model of society. So people have played a lot with, um, with organizational structures that, that combine having small groups, sometimes called affinity groups, sometimes they're called other things, um, and then some mechanism for coordinating among them to make decisions. Um, you know, there, there have been um, some, some spectacularly dramatic failures. Um, I think of the decision-making process at Occupy as having been spectacularly um, ill-suited to the, the, the decision-making needs of the encampment when you've got hundreds of people trying to, to use this unwieldy consensus process. But what's, what's appealing about it um, is how much there's this ethos of inclusion and participation that um, it's not that when, you know, some, some movements in the past when they've engaged in direct action, it's almost, almost like a paramilitary model where people are like troops to be deployed mm -hmm. um, as opposed to active participants shaping um, the, the, the course of the movement's actions. And that, that kind of um, far more direct engagement sustains people's participation over time, I think. It's a, it's a longer, bumpier process, but it pays off. Mm. To end, give us a story from your book or, or your experience about how direct action made a difference. Maybe not immediately, but, but maybe over time. Do you have a favorite? Well, I actually think right now direct action is very successfully helping keep the Trump administration in a state of crisis and help keeping them off balance and slowing down the rollout of the damage that they've planned. Um, and I think we have the potential to do so much more if we trust in our power. There was a moment at the end of the Women's March. You know, the march in Washington, it was so large, it wasn't a single march anymore. It was like water just flowing everywhere. And there was a moment where if we'd had just a little bit more organization, we could have gotten those crowds to completely surround the White House and just stay for a minute. I think that there's a lot of potential on our side that we can escalate the pressure on the Trump administration and really lay the groundwork for something profoundly different if we're willing to take bold action. Jesse, you want to add anything to that? Um, I think that the um, various direct actions and rallies and protests and strikes leading up to and taking place at the same time as the Sanders campaign are um, encouraging. I think that that's a place where we really see the sort of um, mutual reinforcing uh, relationship between more formal politics and more sort of insurgent outside politics. Um, for instance, the communication workers strike that was going on at the same time where Sanders approached them and went on the strike line, they endorsed him, and the two things really kind of fostered one another and, and I think really significantly changed a lot of people's views in the United States and we're going to be um, reaping the rewards of that change in people's minds for years to come. So maybe just a lot, one last question around the storytelling aspect because one of the things that I think is so critical is that these stories don't get told very much. I mean, I say your book was brilliantly timed, but you worked on it for 25 years with a little gap in the middle. Clearly, it was a labor of love, but not just love, kind of insight, it seems to me, into the significance of this teaching, which, with a few exceptions, we can't rely on the media to do. Yeah, so many of the stories about our movements simply haven't been told. It's, 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 it's kind of startling how to contrast how many stories we have about the 60s and how few histories we have of the movement since. And there's uh, an enormously rich collection of legacies there and of examples of times when in the face of crisis and backlash, movements still won. And that, that history and coming to terms with how people manage to do that, I think can be incredibly encouraging at a, you know, a, 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 a treacherous time like the one we live in. Do you think it's enough? I've been reading Sebastian Hefner's Defying Hitler, and he talks about the rise of Hitler in the 1930s and the role that middle, Amer middle Germans played, the majority of whom didn't support him in the election. 60% opposed him in that 33 vote. And yet there was no leader that stood up and the people stayed quiet. And he describes Hitler did this, he said this, he said this, he said this, and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And what difference it might have made if something had. Is what we're seeing enough? to stop the kind of authoritarianism that so many of us fear? 
I mean, it's of course too soon to tell, but what encourages me is how many leaders are stepping up, is we're no longer looking for one figurehead or one leader to rally us all. People are rallying themselves and mobilizing themselves, and that is what's going to save us. I think the same thing holds true for the storytelling question, which is that, especially now that we have the internet and social media, the storytelling can happen on so much more of an individual and um, dispersed level that we needn't really rely on the media or official channels uh, to get those stories out. In the same way that um, we don't really need to rely on a single leader or a centralized leader. We, there's, there are much, many more tools and opportunities for democratic organizing. Thank you both. It's great talking with you. You can find out more about the book, Direct Action and its uh, Radicalizing of American Politics, at our website. Thanks both. Up next, in the run-up to the People's Climate March, the organizers released this report on why marching for the climate is so important. From Boston down to Florida, all the way from the Arctic, all the way from the Gulf, frontline communities standing side by side refusing to give in. Climate change has happened. Climate catastrophe is a reality. We are dying. I'm not a big believer in man-made climate change. has now signed orders saying construction can resume. 30% decrease in the EPA. Trump administration orders a media blackout. We tell them no more. No man, no more. Telling us it's time for us to do something greater than anything our brain ever thought was possible. But this is the greatest uniting of nations, of movements, and of peoples that we've seen in this country in a very long time. We will stand with those who are at the front. Our oceans are not for sale to the highest oil and gas bid. Keep it in the ground! Keep it in the ground! It's about public health, it's about jobs, it's about justice. We are building the path to climate justice one block at a time. We can make Louisiana and all of the Gulf of Mexico 100% renewable if we invest in that. We stand! We stand! For white people! For white people! For water! For water! For life! I believe in this moment, y'all. It's a wonderful moment, y'all. It's a beautiful thing. Nuclear provocation update. It is not just North Korea who can get in on this act. It was an American nuclear weapons test that caused a cloud over Nevada this March. And it didn't take a satellite to see the dust rise. The March 14th test was the first in a new series. U.S. weapons makers are manufacturing a new nuclear bomb, a replacement for four bombs already in our nuclear arsenal. The B-6112 is estimated to be ready for use in 2020. The first in a three-year series of its tests began this March at Sandia National Labs a wholly owned subsidiary of the Lockheed Martin Corporation. Reading from the Sandia Lockheed press release, quote, test day dawn, cloudless and wind free. While observers watched from a tower and more via live video stream, a couple of F-16C jets rose from Nealis Air Force Base near Las Vegas and soared over the 280 miles of the Tonopah Range. Those watching from the tower of the Test Range Operations Center felt excitement and pleasure, they said. But it all worked out as they expected. The only hitch, apparently, was a herd of wild horses who at one point had to be rounded up and headed away from the test site. It is great, they said, to see all things come together. The weapon design, the test preparation, the aircraft, and the people who make it all happen. Everyone involved is supposedly happily hoping that future tests go just as well. The first version of the B-6112 is, as I said, estimated to be ready for use in 2020. That gives everyone a chance to do a lot more tests. It just raises one little question. If North Korean nuclear tests are provocations justifying bombing by foreign powers, what do you think American nuclear tests are? Or to put it more prosaically, who do we think we are? For those living in glass houses, nuclear bombs are one dumb thing to throw around.
I'm Laura Flanders. You can write to me, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, at lauraflanders.com, and tell me what you think. You can also sign up for our free podcast and find all of the archives of this program at our website. That's lauraflanders.com. And thanks.